I think the thing that uh, drove us to do it was about the wanted to do two things. One, to celebrate, let's make more noise. And I think we weren't shouting enough as a city and as a region about the innovation that we have here. And also that other thing was to collaborate. How do we bring people together? How do we make more of, of what we've got? Today, we're talking to Stuart Clark, the festival director and co-founder of Leeds Digital Festival, which is entering its second week of the two-week festivities. This week, we are giving over to Leeds Digital Festival. So not just today's podcast with Stuart, but on Thursday, which is International Podcast Day, we're going to drop four interviews, also recorded on Thursday and Friday last week from Leeds, talking about why the festival is so important and what is going on in the region. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast with myself, David Savage, powered by the Harvey Nash Group, where we bring you insight from leaders from across the industry and a bit of tech news. Joining me today, we've got a quiche. Hello. Hello. It's a good thing you can work from home, isn't it? I mean, not that you would have driven to work, but uh, given the current crisis uh, going on, the ability to work from home is quite useful. It is, it is, it is. It's um, it's very good, actually. And uh, I, I actually woke up on Saturday morning um, at six o'clock to go get some fuel. It or I not. saw this on Instagram, partly yeah. why I mentioned it, because I did think that that was extreme. Do you know why? Because I went to about seven stations on the Friday when I actually needed fuel, because um, my red light came on, mm -hmm. and I had a few places to go on Saturday, um, and I couldn't find petrol anywhere. And then I was at the risk of basically like not being able to drive my car, because I was running out of petrol trying to find petrol which is very interesting. And so I went, right, I'll make the educated decision. I'll go home. I'll see when the nearest pump opens, which was at six. So, mm -hmm. you know, I woke up 10 to six, left at six. I was like, oh, I'll be there in five minutes. No worries. There were already people queuing there for about half five. So I had to queue up for 45 minutes at sat on Saturday morning at six o'clock just to get fuel. And uh, did you take what you needed? Uh, yeah, I literally, you probably saw my Instagram story. I literally put in... About, I think it was about 30 quid, something like that. Because that, that's what I needed for a few errands to run on the weekend. That was it. Like, I don't need to be an idiot and fill up and take my jerry cans with me and all this sort of shit. Oh, did, you see, did you see the name of the BBC presenter or reporter, rather? No, no. Uh, it was uh, Mr. McCann. Oh, was it? The best, the best named reporter ever for a... <laughs> God. <laughs> for a crisis about fuel. Honestly, honestly. Like, it's just ridiculous. The whole world's gone mad. It has gone mad. And do you know what, right? So this is a funny thing. On Friday, not Friday, Thursday, whenever the news broke out, I, I popped out on lunchtime. I had to go to the post office and stuff. So I was just driving. And I was like, I drove past day. I, I didn't, didn't know what had happened in the news that day. I kind of drove past, like, a garage. And I went, crikey, that's a bit full for a lunchtime, isn't it? Like... Yeah, there's about six, seven cars waiting, queuing on the road, waiting to go in. I was like, a bit weird. Didn't really make anything of it. And then as I've come home and I've like, you know, read some stuff on my phone, I've gone, oh, right. But yeah, it is carnage. Everyone's panicking. Yeah. Here we go. We're back 18 months again. At least it's not about Lou Roll this time. It's, uh... I just see quite a funny tweet along the lines of, looking at all the idiots panic buying over fuel and it was a picture of someone of, of, a, of a bathroom window with loo roll stacked up either side of the window <laughs> like, oh no let's not go back there please folks oh, no. um i didn't have to worry about the roads on mm. thursday and friday because i was on a train to leeds and back mm. Mm. um good. and leeds leeds digital festival wasn't just physical events, but is now remote events as well. So those don't even have to worry about those about people on the roads. But uh, as you might might uh, have guessed, today's episode, and in fact this week, is all about Leeds Digital Festival. Starting with an interview with Stuart Clark, the festival director and co-founder, now, and then four episodes on Thursday, which we'll explain why shortly. But first of all, I'll hand over to Stuart, and then we'll be back with some chatter. So today I'm sat in Leeds with, uh, are you the founder? Would you call yourself the creator, the founder? Let's get this right. Co-founder co and festival director. Festival director yeah. of Leeds Digital Festival, Stuart Clark. How are you? Yeah, good. And it's good to have you up in Leeds. And we're getting for the midway point, actually, of Leeds Digital Festival 21. So 
First of all, before anything else, how's it going? It's going really well. Uh, you know, we used to be, a, this is our sixth year of the festival. We used to be a 100% physical uh, festival. Obviously, last year, uh, it was 100% online, and we ended up with having two festivals. Yep. Uh, and then this year, it's a bit of a mix. Where, uh, we've got 300 events, and about 85 are physical events, and the rest on, online. And I think, I think that's a mix we'll have. I think we'll go 50-50 next year. Lots of advantages for, for putting events on, online. But, you know, so many advantages for being able to meet people and collaborate and network in person. I mean, whilst mm. a festival like this is about the local community mm. and Leeds, surely there is something really yeah. brilliant about the opportunity mm. for Leeds to have a brand beyond Yorkshire, to be able to have those events and people potentially interested in mm. investing in the region, seeing what's going yeah. on through those events. Well, that's it. I mean, we always had an international element and that was usually, you know, working with the local council, the mm. local... Uh, enterprise partnerships, the LEP, uh, and they'd often bring delegations from, you know, we've had people and companies from uh, Estonia, from the Netherlands, South Africa, Malaysia, China, that, that type of thing, but you know, they tend to be very formal uh, a, a events and delegations. What was interesting last year, and also we had lots of international speakers because you know, Leeds-based companies have clients and suppliers all over the world, so mm. often you get people flying in, but last year with this move to online, it really push that Leeds brand wider and, and we have people from over 60 countries uh, attend the events from not just you, you, the ones you'd expect, you know, Germany, Canada, uh, US, but from Benin, for Peru, Kazakhstan, the Philippines, just absolutely literally all around the globe. And we've seen that again, how people have taken advantage of that this year. So it's not just about getting the global uh, attendees to, you know, to come along to the events, but, but also speakers from all over, you know, so because, you know, if you're flying somebody from New York, it's expensive, it's a few days out of their time, but just dialing them in for an hour and a half to an event. So you're right, it has really pushed out Leeds name uh, sort of beyond you know, the West Yorkshire County boundary. And look, this, this question out of context could probably appear quite rude and it's not intended to, but those people who are dialing in online, why do you think they're dialing in? Because if you're in, let's say Manila, Where's the interest in Leeds necessarily? Yeah. Is it is it the content rather than the region? Is it the I, region? Is I, it is it doing yeah. more than I would presume? Yeah, uh, I think it's a bit of both. I think I think the content drives it. Uh, and on Monday of this week, uh, we had an online networking event. Mm. Had about forty people on it, and yeah, most of the people were from Leeds and the city region. But somebody was in there from Melbourne, in Australia, which you know, for the networking and collaboration, but. And we've seen that in many events this week. So I think the content does drive it. You know, we've got some great content this year on whether you're interested in fintech, data, health tech, coding, careers, whatever it is. The content is really, really strong. So I think that's the thing that drives it first. But I think that Leeds brand, that Leeds name does resonate because, you know, we've got, we've got a growing reputation for the quality, not just of homegrown talent and innovation and companies, but also companies that are moving into the region, mm. which again helps to share that, that name. You know, just the last few years we've had the likes of uh, uh, Burberry uh, move part of their tech team up, up here. Uh, Channel 4, you have to, you know, it's a legal yep. requirement to mention Channel 4 moving to Leeds <laughs> with their national uh, HQ. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Utterberry announced that they're opening a facility to create 800 jobs. So it's becoming a place where where companies want to move to because of the talent that's already here. Mm. Yeah. So look, let's let's rewind first of all because you you said in your in your opening kind of intro that the fa the, the festival rather has been around for six years. Mm. What was the genesis? Yeah, well, it, the genesis was uh, Leeds City Council put together this uh, day. They call it Digital Strategy Day, and they were sharing their vision for the city. And this was summer of twenty fifteen. So on the back of that, a few of us got together, met in a pub to say, well, you know, what can we do? It's not just down to the council, the LEP, the government, or whoever. What can we do? And there was a mix of about a dozen people. Some were tech uh, startup founders. A couple were run digital marketing agencies. There was a lawyer. There was an accountant and, and, and me. Uh, and so I we decided to come up with the idea, idea of a festival. Not a new idea. Lots of people do it. But I think the thing that uh, drove us to do it was about the wanted to do two things. One, to celebrate, let's make more noise. And I think we weren't shouting enough as a city and as a region about the innovation that we have here. And also that other thing was to collaborate. How do we bring people together? How do we make more of, of what we've got? 
And right from the start, we wanted to make it open platform, so every year anybody can come along and put an event on. There's no charge for event organisers, so you know if you're the newest startup or the biggest tech firm, you can come and put something on. And I think having that open platform with no curation, so you know if you're a fintech company, but this year's theme is is health tech, you know that puts people off. So and I, I think that's the reason behind the growth. From you know first year we had 56 events, you know, this year we've got 304, and it's just grown and grown and grown. And not just the numbers, but the quality of the events. But I think that really open platform. We call it the tech event for everybody, uh, and we've really seen that. But when I when I came up with that uh, phrase a, a few years ago, I think it was sort of twenty percent hope, eighty percent hype. <laughs> but I think it's really turned into re reality. We have so many people wanting to be part of the festival in in some way. And what, how did you tap into that mm. energy initially? Because. Yeah. There's one thing, people sat around in a pub saying, mm. let's put on a festival yeah. and, a, and an open yeah. platform. Yeah. There's another thing entirely, getting, getting companies to, to even know that it's happening. Well, that's, I mean, yeah, um, the first couple of years were, were trickier than, than they are now because we've got a good reputation. And that, that first year, especially like going around asking people for sponsorship, you know, you, we're a bunch of people you never heard of. We're putting on an event that we've never done before. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know who's going to turn up. Don't know how many events there will be because of this uh, open nature of it, and but but can you give us some money, please? Uh, and that took it, you know, and say that first year, fifty six events. I think the year after it was about one hundred and fifteen, mm -hmm. then one hundred and seventy, then two hundred and forty. And one of part of it is that longevity. You keep coming back. People know what you've done. They've seen the success, so they want to be a part of it. They see the quality of the, of the events there, and so it's become this thing where, you know, to our great surprise, when you know planning it all those years ago, it's become a real important fixture in the in the city and the region's tech calendar and people really want to show off, you know, what they're doing, they want to show off their knowledge and their products and services, but they want to show off the city. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of pride in Leeds about what we've all created within within the festival over the last six years. Now look, this podcast has a predominantly London listenership, but then it's actually got quite a few listeners in the US. And unless some of them watch the Premier League, they've probably never heard of Leeds. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's fair to say that, you know, London, it has this global brand primarily because it's the capital city. Yeah. And I then kind of look at Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, Birmingham as these regional cities. And look, I say this with the greatest respect, I am from Newcastle. I, I have a huge amount of pride in the north of England. But it must be quite challenging mm. to know how to stand out from those other regional cities, which yeah. in some cases are similar sized, maybe they've got mm. similar kind of industrial backgrounds. Yeah. And whilst some places in the UK are, are, are burgeoning a reputation, Belfast mm. for cybersecurity yeah. or Birmingham for automotive, mm. What is it, do you think, about Leeds, yeah. about the DNA of this city that stands out and gives you a slight edge and this is our focus? Yeah. Well, well, I think on that, I think we've seen a real change over the last few years about inward investment. And whether that's firms, overseas firms, moving to the UK, 10 years ago, London would be probably the only choice. Mm. But now you see firms moving to those cities you mentioned, Newcastle, uh, Birmingham, and particularly Manchester and, and Leeds. And... You know, we've got that rivalry between you know, over the Pennines, and and fortunately, the Leeds are back in the Premier League, so we can hold our heads up a, a, a little <laughs> bit. But you know, I always think a job created in Manchester is good for Leeds because it, you know it, it makes the North a real viable alternative to to London. We've seen that talent growing up. I think the Northern cities and Midland cities are better at keeping talent from their great universities within their cities rather than you know sort of brain drain down to London, which. Certainly was the case, you know, ten years ago and probably five years ago as well. So I think, you know, and and you know, what does Leeds stand out for? You know, it, there's certain things we we're really good at in the city. Health tech and data are, are two of them, and, and both in those we've got the highest concentration of uh, health tech uh, innovators and data scientists anywhere in the UK outside of, of London. So you know, be, becoming really well known for that. But I think one thing about Leeds, it's it doesn't have that stand out, say. But you mentioned Belfast about the cyber and, and you look at the, some of the AI stuff that's going on in Cambridge. Mm. I think we're good at lots of things. And again, coming back to that collaboration piece, you know, I always say it's Leeds is the most collaborative city uh, in the UK. And people do work together, uh, you know, seemingly day-to-day -day competitors will come together 
to put on events together, to shout about the, the, the city t- together. You mentioned talent a few times. It's interesting you picked up on, on universities keeping yeah. hold of that, yeah. of that young talent coming yeah. into the market. I'm not sure if it's still the case, but Leeds was certainly, I think it was the town with the, or well, city rather, with the, with the yeah. biggest student population in yeah. the UK. And then you've obviously got Manchester, which has another huge student population. Yeah. yeah. Whilst the pandemic is obviously devastating in many respects, is there an aspect yeah. that because people maybe can be more flexible in their working arrangements, they don't, maybe London doesn't have the same pull yeah. that it did, and mm. the, the proximity of those two cities, you're right, it doesn't really matter if you're one side of the Pennine or the other, yeah. if you only have to go in two days a week. And I was on a holiday exactly. with a friend last last week based in, in Manchester who works in Yorkshire. Yeah. And because it's only two days a week, it's not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, th- I think that's it. I think the pandemic has changed things. And, and, and I think on the university side, I think Leeds as a city and as a tech sector are better at engaging with, with the universities, the city colleges, and, and talking about the, the companies that we have instead of, you know, again, probably just four or five years ago, you know, they'd rock up on the last term of the last year and say, hey, come and stay in Leeds, by which time people have made their mind up probably to drift back to you know, to where they where they came from, where the parents are, uh, so I think we've we've got a lot better at that. I think that whole thing, you know, I work with a lot of startups. I'm a director of of, of four and work with a lot of startups uh, every, every month. And the amount of students that are staying in Leeds to build their own tech startup, it's it's huge now. Whereas again, five years ago, people would automatically go to Shoreditch because that's where people like them were based. That's where a lot of funding was was based. But we're much better at keeping them. We're much better at explaining to them about the advantages of being in Leeds. Not least the fact that you know you can rent or or buy somewhere on a on a relatively uh, modest salary. And the salaries in the tech sector up in Leeds are not that much different to London now. You know, so you know there's a lot of lot of companies who are taking on vacancies. Same with Manchester as well. Same with Newcastle, Liverpool. So you can have a fantastic quality of life in Leeds. There's uh, there's that. The other side, we've seen a couple of people, or a couple of people, a couple of people I've heard of, uh, that of living in Leeds and based in Leeds, of taking jobs in London companies. Yeah, because as, ask, as yeah. you say, you know, you don't want to travel to London every day, but if you just have to go in the office once a month, twice a month, that makes it achievable. But I, I, I don't think that'll be a bigger long-term trend. Is there an aspect that that could be good for regional centres because? If someone does yeah. that and they have a London yeah. salary but they're living here, yeah. then they're spending money locally and that's yeah. generating wealth, which means there's yeah. more to go around here, right? Yeah. 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 It's that's difficult right. to it's know a, exactly how it's, it's going to work it's, out. It is. And I think, and also as well, you know, most of the tech firms I know in the region are coming back to two to three days a week. Mm. So that pure 100% remote, I think that's just a, a really tiny amount of the overall jobs available. So, you know, I think most people want to be part of a company, want to enjoy the company culture, want to collaborate, want to be creative with colleagues. Yeah, not every day these days. You know, who wants to go back to that, that slog Monday to Friday, everybody trying to get in the office at the same time. So I think of that more flexible way of working two or three days a week. Yeah. And again, Leeds has got that great opportunity to sell itself and has been selling itself well about the quality of life. You can work for world-class tech firms and you can be in the countryside in 20 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah best countryside in the world, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't come to Yorkshire and, yeah, not, and yeah. not be told that it's God's country. Uh, lastly, then, obviously this yeah. this festival we're halfway through. But what do you think will happen next yeah. year and maybe the year after? Because as you said, you've now got mm. this hybrid model where mm. predominantly physical events, but still yeah. a, a virtual audience. What mm. what are your hopes yeah. for the evolution of the festival? Well, well, I think again the I think the quality will go up again next year. Never that fuss about the number of events. It's all about the quality. But I do think we'll settle into this 50-50, physical and virtual. You know, virtual has got so many advantages. It's cheaper to put on. I mentioned earlier you can bring in guests and attendees from all over. It's more accessible. You know, if you've got a six o'clock uh, event in town, that, that's not accessible for many people, particularly women who you know, shoulder the burden of childcare more, more. So it's hard for people to get back into town. If it's on at six and it's online, you can attend. And it's the you know, people record them. So even if you can't do it at six, you can you know, watch it again in a couple of days time. But, you know, and, and, and as I said said earlier about that, nothing beats that real collaboration and networking. And, the, and I've attended some great online events over this last year, 
from all over, you know, whether it's London, Bristol, New York. But at the end of the event, and you, you know, you learned something, you've been excited by it, and at the end of the event, it's closed, and you sat in the kitchen with your dog, and you know, and you just want to talk to the speaker, you want to share your thoughts. So I think the physical events was, has got such a, a valuable part to play, and again, it brings people together, it brings that collaboration together, and and, that, and that's really key. And you know, and I say that's you know one of the main aims of where we, why we started the festival mm. to bring people together and and to make more of what we've got. And when you're talking to people yeah. who've run their event mm. as part of the festival for the first time, yeah. and you're saying, how did it go? What do, what do you think, having done the event? Yeah. What, do they, what do they say? Uh, <laughs> always really positive, because it's saying, you know, people want to be part of this this thing that, that, that the city and the, sect, the tech sector has, uh, has, has created. You get some great feedback, whether it's a physical or an online uh, event, and people want to do more. You know, you know, every year people come back uh, and, you know, they, they learn from their events, learn from other people's events, you know, steal a few ideas and they want to come back and they want to be part of this big conversation and this, this pride in, in the tech sector that we've got now. Yeah. Well, look, Stuart, it's lovely to talk to you. Thanks for making some time. I hope that this year's festival yeah. continues to go well yeah. and uh, look forward to hearing what's planned for next year. Yeah, thank you so much. And as I say, it's great to have you up, up in Leeds. <laughs> Last year, over 60 countries, the pandemic pushed the Leeds brand or name out there with speakers from all over dialing in. Uh, I think Peru is mentioned to to, to speak about Leeds. So pandemic is obviously awful. Mm -hmm. Um, Leeds Digital Festival is in its sixth year. It had been a physical event up until that point. But there is something to be said for the fact that last year we were all forced online and introduced Areas that I suppose would not have previously had a global audience to a truly global audience. Yeah. And also, didn't he mention um, Melbourne in the interview? Someone from Melbourne? Yeah, so, so they, there was a network. There was a networking uh, event. Someone dialed in, dialed in from Melbourne, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I, I don't know, but if you probably walk around Melbourne and go, have you heard of Leeds? You know, this city in West Yorkshire uh, in England. Probably go, nah. Don't know. Um, but then, you know, I guess it's just a great opportunity for people to get the exposure and also for people just to get the presence um, and link up with people that may, you know, not have kind of walked through the doors if it was a physical festival, um, like the one that you'd attended, right? Yeah. I mean, let's let's be honest. If you are in Melbourne and you're trying to figure out where you might put investment in the UK. Mm. Without Leeds Digital Festival going online and whatever else. Yeah, unless you unless you're into football. Yeah, but that's and, very uh, and that's that's only very very recently again for a long time. Mm. Uh Leeds were in a wilderness. Yeah. Um there's no there's no way of ever finding out about Leeds, really. Mm-hmm. It is a re- it is truly a regional city. It's a great city. It's got masses going for it. But it is a city that Unless you were from the UK, I would argue that outside of London, maybe only Manchester, uh-huh. in in England anyway, has more of a global presence. I think I think you could argue that Edinburgh obviously does, um, and yeah. to an extent Glasgow, but Leeds is you know yeah. you, you're competing seven, eighth, ninth down that list of cities that are that are all kind of competing for space. Oh, yeah. And, and and the thing is, what they're doing at a local level is so good. And it's attracting huge global names, you know, which will inevitably attract investors. It will inevitably attract founders or co-founders of, um, <clears throat> you know, all kinds of organizations. And that will only have a knock-on effect um, and a very positive knock-on effect on the kind of local economy and, I guess the name and exposure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I love the fact that it's open platform. There's no charge and there's no curation. I think this is really interesting, right? Mm. Stuart talks about the fact that Leeds is good at lots of things. Normally, when we're talking about regional centres in the UK, we're talking about Birmingham with automotive. We're talking about Belfast with cybersecurity. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about areas kind of going, right, this is our this is our thing. This is our niche, right? And saying no curation you know oh. not having it as as health tech as being the focus or whatever else because you might turn off the fintech is 
sensible. I, I understand it, but it's almost contrary to what you're told. You're told that events and that the stuff like this needs focus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I quite like the fact that they're going, no, we're going to make it as broad a church as we possibly can and make sure that everyone feels welcome. And, you know, the tech event for everyone, he talks about it being 20% of hope, 80% hype, but mm. now now hopefully realized. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that because a lot of these kind of tech events and we work, well, you know, quite loosely work in the tech industry. I quite loosely work in the tech industry. Um, I, think, I think you work in the tech yeah, industry. In, in, okay, in the tech industry, but I'm not a techie. Um, no, that's yeah, fine. You still yeah. work in the industry. Um, I think sometimes the events can be very much, um, it, it can almost seem a bit exclusive and it can sometimes be very much like, you know, have a bit of um, just a, a little bit of a reputation behind it or something. And and sometimes you have to pay extortion amounts to go to these events or, um, you know, to kind of be involved. And it seems like it's a bit of a boys club at times, um, just with, you know, the, the huge kind of global brands, the people, the sea level kind of, you know, keynote speakers, these sorts of things. But I think what Leeds does is is they bring a bit of that, you know, a bit of the kind of rawness or the, the kind of real, um, I guess the real up and coming kind of stories and products and organizations. And they kind of bring it all together really well um, and invite people like you to, uh, you know, have uh, have your five to 10 minutes of, uh, of, of glory or, or whatever. Um, you know. I, I'm just spreading the word. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, to be honest, I, I think it's great. And I, I would have loved to go with you, actually. Um, I wish I could have gone. So yeah, hopefully next year. Lisa's Lisa fabulous. I, I did I did find it hilarious that as a proud Yorkshireman, Stuart got in that it's the best countryside in the world. Um, I once worked in a hotel that banned bookings from, from, from people from Yorkshire. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Because every person that ever went just told everyone else that Yorkshire was the best place on the planet. It's like, well, why come here and tell everyone that? Yeah, that's very true. That's very <laughs> true. And God forbid you say no, the but... L word around there. And, uh, you know, all, all hell could break loose, really. If you but, you know, that. the Dales, yeah. I mean, one of the things that kept coming up that week, you know, we've got access to the Dales, we've got access to the Moors. It's like, mm. yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a pretty good place. You can see why there's a lot of enthusiasm right now. So... It was great to go up. It was great to have some time with Stuart. We've got four other interviews. I alluded that we were going to drop four. We are. Um, Thursday is is International Podcast Day. Uh-huh. So on Thursday, because it will still be uh, Leeds Digital Festival, um, there'll be just the, the two days left at that point, we're going to drop interviews with um, Will Smith from Tread. Uh, we're going to drop an interview with Johnny at Fleet Marketing, Crispin Reed at Coders Guild, Susie Bell at Ahead Partnership, and bring you plenty more insight and opinion uh, from a range of different companies about why, in particular, Leeds is garnering so much attention. But at this point, we're going to drop to a quick advert break, and when we come back, um, we're going to have a very quick chat about the metaverse. A couple of years ago, Michael and Jacob, two friends from London, were both thinking about their consumption and sustainability as a whole. Michael, a professional footballer at the time, realised he had no options when it came to sustainable sportswear. Overconsumption and underuse was all too common. Hilo was born, a sportswear brand fighting for the planet by changing mindsets. They started with a running shoe made with seven natural materials, and the shoe could be recycled at the end of its life. As a company, they've offset their carbon to beyond zero, making them carbon negative. You can find out more about Hilo and support their mission at hiloathletics.com. That's H-Y-L-O. We support the Hilo movement. What is the metaverse, bro? So Keisha's clearly a little bit perplexed by this, but the metaverse is is basically, uh, right, okay, well, the Matrix, Ready Player One, they are examples of the metaverse, virtual reality environments that are wholly immersive where you can interact with other people. Right, 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 got you, got you. Because I was was just looked at you and like, what the hell is a metaverse? Ridiculous. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Now, this is is interestingly timed, right? Because Uh um, I have interviewed Facebook for... um, uh, Big Data and AI Expo North America. Mm-hmm. That interview is going to be aired this week, uh, talking specifically about virtual reality and AI. And in the paper today, 
Nick Clegg, who, as many people might be aware, is now employed by Facebook um, as, as one of their lobbyists, is setting out the tech giant's vision of a virtual world where you can shop, work, and live. Um, uh, if you're not familiar, by the way, with the term metaverse, it came about in a 1992 science fiction novel called Snow Crash. Um, but yeah, it looks like we are on the getting towards the cusp of something in the along the lines of Ready Player One. Kind of a virtual environment that you can almost um, survive the, the the majority of the day in. Nick Clegg, right? <laughs> Here we go. Is it that, the Lib Dem guy. Yes. The Deputy Prime Minister at once of the UK, Mister Coalition yes. Government. That guy. Yes. Bloody hell! Has he wrangled himself into Facebook? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, Christ. You know, when we said that you do work in tech, maybe we should have seen that with with that comment. Yeah, no, I I just, um, you know, Lib Dems, politicians, these sorts of things, they're all very, uh, they're banned words on my uh, my (laughs) Twitter feed. They don't come up. Nothing nothing to do with them comes up. Oh, that's ridiculous. Okay, that's interesting. Um, So you basically can live in... In, in an environment for a day, right? Yeah, well, no, yeah. Zuckerberg is talking about the fact that you can, you can basically, he's sharing the the vision of this idea that you, you know, you might wear a VA, VR headset. Surprise, yeah. Facebook owns Oculus. So no, no, no wonder that they are talking this up. Mm. But you don't just view content, but be inside it. So it's an online space built by companies, creators, developers, in which people could also live lives so virtually going to performances and even work mm-hmm. and this is interesting that this, this is beginning to gain momentum we we were talking to uh polystream um on a on an episode of of the podcast and in conversation with bruce bruce grove their ceo where he's talking about the fact that they now have a platform that can place you in games so oh. if you've got Fortnite, for example you're not just watching what other people are doing in on a screen but you put on a headset and you are in the same environment but you're a non you're, you're a non-playing spectator and it kind of is almost like a step towards you don't just watch a football match uh, at home, but you put a headset on and you're in the stadium and so are other people and you look around and you kind of almost could select a virtual seat to sit in. Right, okay, right. It's it's, it's, it's all a bit weird for me, really, that. I, I, I just don't know. I don't, I, I, I'm just trying to think how long a whole day is. Like maybe for two minutes, it's probably fun. <laughs> But, no, you could well, you could definitely watch a sports event or a concert yeah, in, that, yeah. in that environment. Yeah. Say, so, say, like for me, for example, yeah. if someone turned around to me living in Kent and said, for a quarter of the price, mm-hmm. you can have a virtual home ticket and be in St James's Park, I'd do that. Yeah. Every every weekend, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, for, for, for every home match, yeah, yeah. For, for these large events and stuff, I think that's a great idea, and it's definitely doable. But I, just think- I mean, it's not going to be doable at Newcastle because there's no way that Mike Ashley would invest in that. But Correct. maybe if you support a proper football club. Yeah, or or even like other sports like, you know, F1 and, and these sorts of things where the tickets are ridiculous, you know. Cricket. Or, yeah. Go go watch go watch an IPL in inside an Indian yeah, stadium and experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So things like that, I think, would, would definitely be great. But And if you think about working environments, right, mm. we, we've already seen kind of um platforms um that so we've used one called v together where you're like an avatar in a space if it was more immersive and you can walk up to someone and have a meeting with them Mm -hmm. rather than just be on a screen Mm -hmm. we'd probably go for that Mm. that is very true yeah yeah i I think what the, the pandemic has done is it's almost like laid the framework or the groundwork for stuff like this and people people are sick of 2d screens Mm. they want interaction um Mm. but we are appreciative of the fact that actually international travel isn't always the the best thing yeah. um, for the planet and possibly more. Yeah. And so this is like a, a, a hybrid that works, perhaps. I think also what it's done, it's made the virtual concept less freaky. Like a, yes. a lot of a lot of corporate or big, you know, old school organizations, they always found that the virtual, oh, why would you meet someone virtually? You know, go shake their hand, you know, sit in front of them, stare them in the eye and, you know, all these like um, cliches that you hear, I think all of those have now gone out the window. And I think when you now say to someone, oh, let's just meet on Zoom or, or on Teams and stuff, it's it's done a lot better um, or it's received a lot better, should I say. 
Um, and I think the, the clout around, oh, all right, stop showing off or stop trying to be some sort of, you know, technical person. Now it's like, oh, yeah, cool. All right, send me the link and, you know, I'll, I'll be there at that time kind of thing. Yeah. So I think it will just be a natural progression onto this, you know, which will, the next step, it will be the kind of virtual reality stuff, um, which should be interesting. Yeah, Facebook, yeah. Uh, Facebook obviously, they were, they, they were doing glasses last week. We spoke about that, didn't we? And then... Uh, now they want to put on headsets. So I wonder what else. Is well, there. I thought I'd mention it because it was quite well timed with the fact that I'd I'd done a. I mean, I hate the word fireside chat, but whatever. Um, a fireside chat with Spencer Ante, uh, who's the head of editorial at Facebook IQ. That's yeah. uh, you can watch it on demand from the 29th of September, part of AI and Big Data Expo, as I said, North America. So um, I'll put a link in the show notes if you fancy watching that or registering to be able to watch that. Then. Not only is it an article about the metaverse and, and VR and what Facebook's vision is, it's a bit of a chat with them to find out a little bit more and ask some questions that obviously um, are pertinent as a, as a, as a consequence. Mm, lovely. Look at that. Bit of news tied in with a bit of extra content, Akish. Yeah, that is very good, mate. And a, and a good link towards uh, International Podcast Day on Thursday. where Oh, well, where lots more from Leeds. Lots more from Leeds. You know, loads of episodes to celebrate it, and uh, yeah. we're going to be marching on together. <laughs> couldn't resist it. Couldn't, couldn't. You, you, I, I, I hope one of the interviews you've actually got someone, you know, singing that. No, cool. maybe, no, maybe, maybe if I can find a way that it doesn't break royalties, we can include it in one of the episodes. Yeah, can we add it in? How's it going to break royalties when you've got about twenty thousand people shouting it? I mean, oh, I don't know. I'm just being a bit cautious. Yeah, you know. Or, or maybe I'll have to give you a rendition later on. But, uh, but you're going to sing marching on together, yeah, yeah. in a voice note. Well, yeah, you know, you can. You can <laughs> is it, is it, is, I've said a lot worse and sang a lot worse. No worries. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> right, <laughs> uh, we'll be back with you. As I said, at a slightly different time Thursday. Four episodes. Look out for them. Uh, until then, have a lovely week, everyone.